induction plus a, a maintenance uh, regimen. You have your refractory population. And this is a little harder to define. This definition is changing. This is really no tumor-free interval in BCG. And for patients with CAS, it's, it's, it's determined to be six months is the time point. And for patients who have papillary tumors who, who progress, we, we tend to, uh, you know, pull the trigger at, at three months. And, for, and certainly, in patients with T1 disease and have T1 disease at three months, those patients should come off of interventional therapy and be directed towards a cystectomy. Then you have relapses. And relapses are patients who have a complete response to BCG, but then develop recurrences at some time point. So early recurrences can be less than one year, and then as late recurrences are greater than two years, the gray zone is in the middle. And if patients who have had a complete response to BCG fail, you know, two years or more beyond their last dose, Probably you'll get a good bang for your buck with uh, attempting BCG therapy. There's clearly nothing better than BCG at this time point. Now, one of the critical um, issues, you know, problems we face, those of us who treat this disease, is what to do with these patients. You know, these patients who fail BCG, what do you do? I mean, if you if you choose more intravesical therapy, oh, forgive me a message here. But climbing two two minutes of stairs per day. There you go. Okay. Um, you, you run the risk of progression and death. If you choose a cystectomy, you run the risk from comorbidity and overtreatment. So somewhere in, in long here, you've got to figure out where, what your threshold is for patients progressing, what your threshold is for accepting morbidity for the potential curative treatment. Now, are the guidelines helpful in, in directing you? I would say not so much. These are the 2007 AUA guidelines. They recommend for patients who fail BCG, further intravesical therapy, or a cystectomy, and the choice really depends upon the nature of the recurrence, the timing of the recurrence, the grade, the stage, the result of a TR, et cetera. So clearly, there is not really any good data out there to direct you to how to make this decision for these patients that fail. I can tell you that the safest approach is cystectomy, and I think that's, that's what I always tell my patients who are, who are deciding what to do. I say cystectomy is the most conservative treatment. That's the best chance you have not dying of your cancer. And then they have to decide what they want to do. First question is, do we have time uh, to find an alternative to cystectomy? Well, you know, in the past, uh, Harry Herr published data showing that if you waited more than two years, that was, that was, uh, that was uh, detrimental. This is more recent data that shows that basically you have about a year to, to, to declare uh, victory or defeat. If you, have, if you fail to, um, to respond to interventional therapy uh, within a year, then your, then your survival uh, goes down. Uh, dramatically. Similarly, with the number of TURs, if you have more than five TURs and still without a, without a response and you keep recurring, your outcome decreases. So you have you have a finite period of time, probably somewhere around six months to a year, to make a decision. So what are some historical treatments for BCG failures? Well, nothing has been very effective. Bill Catalona published in the 80, in the 80s, giving a third course of BCG. And what was really ironic here was that more patients progressed or died of bladder cancer than responded. Interferon alpha, given as a protein, hasn't been very effective. Uh, Metamycin C has been evaluated, but this is, these are not all in high-risk patients. It's interesting. Valrubicin has been approved for the treatment of BCG failures. And look at the, look at the response rates. 8% to two-year NED. So clearly, this is not a real threshold that we need to, we need to shoot for. We need to do better than that. But this, this drug was, was, was approved uh, with a very, very poor uh, response. Clearly, cystectomy is the most effective treatment for eradicating disease and preventing recurrence. And, and I think right now the FDA is very sensitive to the unmet need uh, for salvage intravesical therapy. And a lot of companies are becoming very interested because they see this as a, a well-defined path for registration of new agents in bladder cancer. So a new you know, I think if you're going to avoid cystectomy, I, think, I still think cystectomy is the, is, the, is the first choice of treatment for these patients. But to avoid cystectomy, we do need new approaches. There's a lot of different options and, 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 and that have been attempted trying to improve BCG therapy. Other immune approaches are being tested, and, and new ones will come down the pipe in the future. Uh, there are strategies involved in chemotherapy. You here have, a lot, have done some work with antisense therapy, and we have been working on developing gene therapy. So this, this paper was published by, um, by Michael Donald in 2004, and this was thought to be a game changer. This was his results of, of BCG plus interferon, in BCG naive patients and BCG failures. They had a remarkable 42% durable response in these patients who failed BCG. 
and this is thought to be wonderful news, and, and the answer to BCG failures. The problem is that the, the, the devil's in the details. And many of these patients didn't meet the definition of BCG failure. Many of these patients that only had only had a conduction course of BCG and weren't by definition BCG failures. And those patients, you know, SWOG, one of the SWOG studies showed that about 60% of patients with CIS who have who have CIS after the first maintenance course of BCG will respond to the to the maintenance course of BCG. So you know that's a that's a big that's a, that's a confounder for the interpretation of this data because if you looked at the data, of course those patients who failed twice, the very patients who want to treat with uh, these new therapies are the ones that didn't do very well. Now more recently, a new a new immune approach. This was the MMC. Um, like a special cell wall complex. This was developed by BioNiche, I think a Canadian company. It was it was licensed by Endo, who ran this trial with pretty good results. I don't think they really they really presented their their, their work to the um, FDA very, in, in a very favorable way, and the FDA didn't approve it. But I know recent you know, but the, the results are pretty good. At one year, 35% recurrence free survival for patients with papillary tumors, and 21% for patients with CIS. That's not bad compared to what's out, out there. And I think I, I believe BioNiche has, has has taken over the compound again, and it's attempting to get it approved based upon the, their, their data. This is a trial of chemotherapy. This is a swag. Can I ask a question? Sure. Is that uh, uh, randomized, or is this? Uh, no, it's phase, it's phase two. It's phase two. It's so two. Because phase two is registering when it's kind of open. Yeah. And this is all BCG refractory. Well, it depends on the definition, but the BCG refractory, so the FDA is allowing, that we've had a lot of discussion with the FDA, so the FDA is going to allow BCG refractory or relapsing, if they relapse within one year, have to high-grade disease in phase two. You probably have to do two phase two, but because of the nature of the disease, they recognize that it's not feasible to do a, a randomized trial, and so they're allowing us, and this is if it's an orphan disease, right, that they're allowing us to do that. If you can come in with a biomarker that can predict response, you have a true one. So this is a trial, of, a phase two trial of gemcitabine, maintenance gemcitabine for one year, run by a swab, and again, for the same results uh, as other trials, at two, at two years, 20% um, uh, freedom from recurrence at two years. Well, again, which is close, it's somewhere in the ballpark of what would be acceptable with, uh, to the FDA. Now this is just a recent, I just put this in, this is a recent publication coming out of Nijmegen looking at chemohyperthermia uh, for, um, for non-muscle basic disease. And they've used out of epirubicin or mitomycin, we've never used this MD Anderson. <clears throat> and, they, and here you have the highly recurrent population. You can see pretty good response rates, about 40% response rate at, uh, at, at close to two years. It's not clear though that these aren't all high, high risk patients, high grade patients, high risk patients, and they won't, this wouldn't you have to include the high, high risk patients in order to get have approval here, in, at least in the U.S. Uh, for this type of an approach, because the natural history of low-grade bladder cancer is totally different than high-grade bladder cancer. Now, again, this is work that's been pioneered by by, by Martin and Alan So around this uh, early trial of OGX427, um, any sense of tied to HR protein 27, again promising results. And are you, are you, I guess you're developing it for. It for are randomized phase two in the static right. therapy. I knew that. And exploring um, path in the Right, okay. Now we actually, at our place, focused on intervascular gene therapy. And why was that? Well, we, we thought that, for instance, the bladder is an ideal organ for gene therapy because one could establish direct contact with the vector and the tumor, allowing for the transfer of the gene. It's the same, um, the same would be true for the antisense approach that you use here with easy access to urine and tissue to monitor the effects and perform correlate studies that might help you to identify likely responders. We do have animal models that are available to optimize treatments, but the problem was the early trials were very disappointing. Even though you could put a gene in and have contact with the bladder, there was no gene transfer. So it was not what we expected. We were actually very fortunate. We worked with a company called Kanji. They're a subsidiary of, of sharing. They developed this compound called SYN3. And SYN3 was actually a contaminant in a, in, in a detergent they were testing as an adjunct to enhance uh, a gene transfer. So they found out that these, there's a detergent called Big Chap. And one company's Big Chap was better at allowing the gene transfer. So they, they, did some, they did some chromatography work and found that actually there was, the active agent was a contaminant. So they, so they, so they actually are synthesizing that and it helps to do a, a, 
uh, a Lopergene transfer. So this is an experiment that they did in rat bladders. Here's a bladder with, that was instilled the gene beta galactosidase, which turns things blue without SYN3. And with SYN3, you can see all the bladders on the, on the, on the side are all blue, so showing the effect of gene transfer. And down below, you have examples of an uh, the experiment they did with an adenovirus containing P53. So they took P53 in the middle panel with uh, SYN3, without SYN3, and then stained with immunosuppressant antibodies to P53. And you can see pretty strong staining across the urethelium when they administered SYN3. So we, developed, we worked with them to develop interferon gene therapy. And why do we, do we select interferon gene therapy? We'd like to say it's because we had a tremendous interest in developing it. This was work done by my laboratory years ago. Jonathan Nazawa, another Canadian who's, a, who's a, is in London, was, was the first author in the study. So we had a, long, a, a, a big interest in it, but the reality is it's very practical. Our collaborators at, at, at Kanji had SYN3, and they had adenoviral vector containing interferon gene. So we had an interest, but that's why we did it, because they had all the, all the pieces. And Bill Benedict developed a, a model um, where in whereby he then still human bladder cancer cells. They were uh, transfected with GSP into the bladders of, of, of a family of mice. And then you can image these tumors at one week, two weeks, and three weeks, and you can see the tumors are growing. And here's an example of a tumor before treatment, a single dose of treatment with AD interferon with SYN3. And you can see post-treatment that we got tremendous regression of these tumors. Now, investigative reporting by Peter Black and his, and his group identified that the actually the cell line that we used here wasn't actually a bladder cancer cell line. So variant, isn't it? So variant? Hila? No, Cervical. So it was actually, it, it, the, 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 the people who gave us the cell line actually got it mixed up, but it's a pretty virulent cell line. So if you can kill that, you can probably kill anything. And based upon some strong preliminary data, we, um, we actually convinced uh, sharing to support a phase one trial. This is a phase one trial, 80, 80 interferon with SYN3, high grade non muscle basal bladder cancer, failing BCG, either refractory or relapsing. Uh, and, and what we found from the phase one was that AD interferon sent through safe and well tolerated. We had no dose living toxicity. We also were able to um, identify effective gene transfer with the SYN3 because we could measure increased levels of interferon alpha in the urine of patients that were treated. So we actually were transferring the gene. And because we didn't believe that single insulation was, 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 would be useful, uh, we were able to retreat at 90 days. And, and in doing so, could produce uh, high urine interferon levels at the highest doses of the AD interferon. Now, while it wasn't a therapeutic trial, the early results were quite promising. Six to 14 patients um, achieved a CR at three months. One of those patients died of uh, other causes the next year. 40% of patients had maintained a CR at 12 months, which was fairly um, uh, uh, promising at the time. And based upon that, we went to phase two. Now, this is the linear urine uh, interferon levels in, the, in, these, uh, in these patients. And you can see the highest dose and quite high, high levels of interferon that are being sustained uh, for several days. And this, and this, this dose and, and dose level three were the two doses that went on to phase two. So we conducted a phase two trial of AD interferon, a straight phase two, uh, two doses, one times 10 to the 11th and three times 10 to the 11th in patients who were high risk, refractory, or, or relapsing within one year. All had to be high grade. And this trial was a multi center trial that was uh, performed by the Society of Logical and Quality's Clinical Trials Consortium Group, uh, 15 centers in the, US, in the U.S. The CTC was actually a consortium that was uh, started by, uh, founded by uh, Martin, uh, Bob Uzo, and myself, uh, as a, you know, copying and, and, and mimicking the uh, successful FOG organization to try and find a, a, a mechanism to get encourage, you know, American neuro-oncologists to get involved in clinical trials. And this was, a, this was the first bladder cancer trial that we completed, 15 centers trial. 43 patients, we did it in less than about a year, which is pretty remarkable for this patient population. So the, the primary endpoint for this was at one year, 25% of patients being free of a high grade recurrence. We wanted to, to change the, the endpoint because before, if you had a, if you had a recurrence, you're taken off trial. So if you had high grade disease and recurrence with low grade disease, if you're treating people with, with BCT, you wouldn't stop the BCT. You, you keep treating them because you think that's a favorable uh, response because the disease is actually improving. So we actually, our, 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 have a, the FDA is actually accepting that definition as well. And we have some secondary endpoints looking at urine interferon and biomarkers of response. The results should be available later on this year and will then, you know, it's promising uh, be with the FDA to discuss the registration strategy. Now, there are circumstances 
in which I think you need to immediately go to succession. I mean, at this time, so I hope you, you, have, you have the opportunity to, to mess around and try intermestral therapy. Now, just look at this. This is a T1 bladder cancer. You can just look at this tumor. Here's the muscular propria. I defy you to call that a superficial tumor. I defy you to be able to resect that whole thing entirely. That's, a, that's, a, that's an aggressive invasive disease. But that's what we're dealing with the T1 disease. And studies have shown that the first shot at cystectomy is your best chance for cure. And this is a study that looked at um, cystectomies for primary T1 and, or patients who had, had tried intervestal therapy and failed. And obviously, cystectomies uh, up front is, is a better uh, approach to these patients. So I thought all my patients who have T1 disease, I re resect them. I, even if the re is negative, I do tell them that the most conservative therapy is, is a cystectomy. If I, if I understage do it to be fatal, because there's no way that, that our intervestinal therapies will penetrate the wall of the bladder, maybe now with some of the new folks, maybe, but it's a, it's a fatal error to understage these patients and give them intervestinal therapy. So I, I, I tell all my patients that. Now, this is data from Harry Hur showing the, the impact of a re resection uh, on the outcomes. These are all patients with T1 disease. If you had recurrent, or if you had residual T1 on your rear section, you can see that your your chance of, um, of of progressing is about 80% over five years, and most of those people are going to progress within the first two years. So if a patient has T1 disease, you did a good resection, you go back and rear section them, which you should do all patients. I usually do it around four to six weeks. If they have residual disease, it's T1, then I I really direct all those patients to radical suspect. I think it's the safest, and, and clearly the data would support that. If you have LVI in the TURBT specimen, it's also a high risk feature. This is data that was published showing the difference in outcome for patients who had LVI versus no LVI after, after treatment. You can see that those patients with LVI do very poorly. I usher them to a cystectomy as well. I even discuss new adjuvant chemotherapy with those patients because they do have tumors in the vascular spaces of, of their of the bladder tumor. This is another study that looked at four high-risk features and, and there was, that were um, significant on univariate analysis, on multivariable analysis. Two of them were, were, were significant. Again, vascular invasion. And then look at this, the appearance of the tumor. So if, the, if you look at the tumor cystoscopically and it looks sessile, it's not on a base, and it comes back at as, as a T1 lesion, those tumors have a very bad poor, poor prognosis. In my mind, again, are akin to a muscle invasive disease. And again, very strongly would encourage, especially with a larger tumor, encourage those patients to go to suspect. Now, what about variant histology? This is a manuscript that Peter, Peter published when he was at, at MD Anderson with us, looking at variant histology. This is all variants. This would be clinical papillary, sarcomatoid, TCC, plus some other features. And what he found was that the outcomes for variant histology treated endoscopically was worse. And for patients who had pure TCC. Now, one of the most, at least in our mind, one of the most virulent um, variants is micropapillary disease. The group of Memorial might contest us on that, but at least in our experience, it's a very virulent uh, uh, disease. This is our experience with BCG therapy for these patients. We had 40 patients who got BCG, 30 of the 40 or 75 preferred, and 45 progressed to the muscle invasive disease or distant metastasis, mostly with one in one year. You know, 21 delay, underwent delayed cystectomy. Only 10 patients, so only a quarter, are still alive with the bladder. So clearly, these patients are at high risk. And again, I usher these patients to an immediate cystectomy. So you got your progression free and your occurrence free survival for these patients. And this is the outcome according to treatment at, 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 at diagnosis. Those patients who had initial cystectomy had obviously a small numbers, but a much better prognosis of those patients that got BCG up front. So again, we, 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 we um, caution all of our patients and direct all of our patients with micropathology disease to radical suspect. Now, involvement of the prostate, well, there's, there's not a lot of good data on looking at prostate cerebral involvement. I mean, nobody has any good data. <clears throat> this data comes from a um, review article that Sam Chang published in 2009. And you can see that in, in, in the literature, there are good, pretty good results in response rates to, um, to intervestinal BCG for patients who have you know, CAS in the urethra. And even the prosthetic ducts. I think it's important that you know these patients. If you have a patient with a bulky tumor at the bladder neck, it's important to do a deep TUR to rule of stromal invasion. So that that stromal invasion of the prostate, that intravascular therapy is not indicated. The cystectomy and, and possibly even yeah, chemotherapy is, is indicated there. 
I guess it's safe uh, to give BCG for minimal ductal involvement. I mean, I'm not really a fan of it because I, after you resect the prostate urethra, it's very, very difficult to follow the stitch. And, you know, you just have nothing, nothing more to resect. And so I, I, I'm really uneasy about uh, treating patients with ductal invasion um, with, with intravascular therapy, but there's data out there to support it. So you have to take, you make your choice here. So these are my indications for high risk disease where I would, where I would send patients off or, or, or release counsel them towards a cystectomy. If you've done, in every three things, you've done inadequate TUR. So, for instance, a high grade TA or T1 lesion at the dome. If you have a T1 lesion at the dome and you're afraid that you do a deeper section, you're, you're afraid of doing a, a really complete resection because of the risk of perforation, that's a problem. And, and you have to go back and resect those patients. So, that's a problem. So, I, if those patients, if, you, if it's a large tumor, I'm very insecure about progressing, proceeding with interventional therapy, even if I don't find residual T1 in my root section, because I can't be sure. But there's not a sampling error because of the, the concern of, of resecting and, and perforating blood at that point. If they have deep laminar appropriate invasion, like that slide I showed you, those patients have extended. They used to talk about T1B, A, B, and C, no longer use those distinctions because the muscular pose is not reliably identified and pathologically. But what your pathologist might say is extensive uh, laminar appropriate invasion. I mean, and, uh, when I see that, I know that this is a bad tumor. And again, those patients, again, I counsel to a cystectomy. We have micropathoid features or lymphopathic invasion. And even for me, you know, involvement of the prostate trauma for sure. And I even, I even talked about cystectomy very early on to patients with prostate ductal involvement. Especially those patients who, who had superficial disease in the bladder and then later developed ductal involvement. I, call, I consider this to be a progression of the disease. If you have persistent uh, T1 disease at re resection or cystitis appearance at cystoscopy, I'm also very, very suspicious. And again, we caution these patients against intravascular therapy. Now, that's not to say that with good selection, patients can't do very well. So this is a slide that was sort of um, um, put, uh, adapted from um, the Stassi's original work with uh, locomotive mitomycin C and BCG, where he showed the difference in, 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 in recurrence free survival between BCG and BCG with locomotive mitomycin C. But if you look at the BCG alone arm, these are pretty remarkable results. I mean, these are outstanding results. All patients T1. Disease-specific survival going up to 10 years, 83%. I mean, that's that's unheard of. So that that does show you with careful selection and, and careful rigor sections that perhaps you can achieve those types of uh, those types of results. So how do we treat it? How do we treat non-muscle based disease at MD Anderson? Well, the low risk patients, those are the primary TA low grades, you know, they have a 40 percent recurrence rate, very low risk of, of progression. These are a nuisance tumor, like a, like a wart or skin cancer. We treat them with a TUR plus or and Plus or minus perioperative chemotherapy. Again, this is a moving this is a moving target as patients can go from one risk group to another. In the intermediate risk group of patients, it's patients with multiple tumors that are low grade or multiple recurrences. Again, I would I would choose to treat these patients with perioperative chemotherapy and then try it and try a, 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 a try treating with intravascular chemotherapy maintenance therapy because it's much less toxic. I mean, there's a lot of toxicity in patients that receive PCG. And then for the high-risk patients, these are patients with T1 disease, high-grade disease, CIS, or large tumors. And we include large tumors because there's often an invasive foci in those large tumors that you might miss. High rate of recurrence, high rate of progression. These tumors are, are the real threat of this, of this disease. We treat these by TUR, re-resection, and maintenance BCG, and selective cystectomy uh, for, for patients with higher, who are really at high risk of progression. So I think in terms of the optimal management of, the, of this disease state, I think it's important to, I mean, as, as urologists, you've got to really, we see that patient as the index tumor, it's really important that you resect that tumor adequately, get a deep margin, and get muscle. We sometimes use CISPU as, as an adjunct to white light cystoscopy. I usually use CISPU in patients who have um, positive cytology with no evidence of tumor. Uh, I think it's important to read TUR, all T1s, and most high-grade tumors. I think you need to rule out the high, really high risk patients because those patients should not get the vesicle therapy. And you really can't be shy about an early cystectomy for a fractured disease. And clear, clear, it's really clear that if you're going to attempt bladder preservation, right now it's a double edged sword. They have attempted bladder preservation in the face of an adequate therapy, which, which, is, which is causing patients to die of this disease. We really do need new approaches. I want to thank you for, for uh, inviting me to speak with you today and leave with the words of a wise man who said, hey, what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so.